All right. So, have, we're switching out of the production and into the business planning. So we have Ken Slaybrook. I'm sure you all know him by now. Uh, CHS Green Marketing. Um, he'll talk to us about some green marketing. So, Ken, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Again, I'm Ken. A um, little bit about myself from the Valer area originally, born and raised there, and then uh, came up here to Conrad in uh, 95, is when I moved back to Conrad out of Bozeman. I uh, worked for the A Experiment Station for a number of years. I worked for Harvest States at that time. Um, when I left the uh, department, Mental and Range Science, and then uh, I went back to Harvest States in 02, or to CHS is what they call it now, but I've been with them ever since. So I've gotten uh, a lot of experience with grain marketing, uh, finance, agronomy, grain, uh, you name it, feed. So I've gone through all the gamuts of it. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of experience that I've gotten and, and have received from our elders um, throughout this whole industry. Um, I can talk about anything. I know enough, just enough to be dangerous about some subjects. So, but anyway, what we're gonna talk about today is the introduction to the grain marketing uh, futures and basis. Try not to overwhelm whelm yourself with this. Uh, marketing grain, it's not that difficult. The hardest part is trying to decide when to pull the trigger. When is enough enough? So we'll go through this. Let me see if I go the right way with this here. What do I have to do? Am I on backwards? Okay, understanding the market information. You hear on the radio, we're, uh, it's bullish. The market's bullish. The market's bearish. Bullish means that the market's going to go up. That's what people are feeling like. Right now, spring wheat market, we're all bullish. Okay, so we think that market in the futures market is going to go higher. If you're, bull or if you're bearish, then it's going to go lower. Okay, so we've got a glut of wheat on the, on the market. Nobody can buy it. We're bearish, okay? That's not only with the futures market. It's also with your basis, okay? And we're going to talk about that also. The futures market could be crawling all the way up to $11 a bushel. But if the exporters don't want it, if we can't get it over the ocean, the basis is going to get bad. So that's bearish on the basis side. Okay. So there's a, there's a couple things. That's what the bullish and the bearish mean. The local impacts. So what's happening in our, not just out your window, but in your region. Not only in your region, but what's happening in the United States. What's happening in the Midwest. The global impact. What's happening in Russia, Ukraine, China, the United States, Canada? Uh, basis and futures impact, I just said about that. Is, it, is the news relevant? Is it fake news? What's going on with it? There's a lot of factors that come into this marketing. So here are... Uh, where we get good marketing information. We got to find where we can get this information that it's easy for you to understand. Everybody learns differently in this business. Um, as farmers, don't ever think that you are beneath anybody else. We have so much information today at our fingertips. There are websites out there that we can go on to that you understand. Maybe the diers really understand that. 
but I don't understand it. So that's a key point where they want to go to get that information. The TV, every morning, Ag Day, it's amazing what they come across with on Ag Day. Take the time. At lunchtime, they have it recorded, market day report. So at lunchtime, grab your iPad, grab your phone, watch that. It's, uh, there's a lot of good information on it. But the morning reports are the best reports because it tells you what happens overnight, what has gone on in the marketplace. Uh, TV, radio, of course, uh, the radio side, those markets are always delayed. Today we have the technology that we can get up-to-date information at any time with what the market's doing. And we need to find those. Um, CHS hedging, um, that is the where I go. I get these prompts every day, uh, every morning. I'll get them, and then I'll get them at 10 o'clock, and then at noon, after close, 1 o'clock. And they will give us the information that we need, what is relevant for that day, okay? So it keeps you abreast of what's happening. Barchart.com, a lot of different people on that, a lot of commentators, okay? There's, you can read anything about cattle market, corn market, soybean market, wheat market, Everybody's got their own opinion, and so you got to be careful to form your own opinion. Don't take somebody else for granted. Just say, well, Penn said, no, don't do that. You have to find your own, your own a comfort zone when you're finding this information. Staying relevant to it, though, you got to stay on it. If it's something that you, at, at the end of the day, we can all go out there and we can start our tractor and we can put seed in the drill. We can put fertilizer in. We can go plant that crop. We can bring the sprayer out. We can spray our crop. We can harvest our crop and put it in the bin. Yay. Where's our money coming from? The marketing. That's where you make your money in farming is the marketing. You need to be marketing 12 months out of the year. You're farming six, seven months out of the year. Marketing is one of the is the most important thing when it comes to this. Because if you cannot sell your crop and make a profit for all the inputs you put into it, you got nothing. You just went backwards. Marketing is something that you need to do 12 months out of the year. Keep in touch with your local uh, companies, whether it be CHS, whether it be Columbia Grain, UGC, Mountain View, Whoever's out there that you feel comfortable with, visit with them and always make that phone call. Even if they are not reaching out to you, you reach out to them. You make the phone call. Hey, what's happening in the market? Show them your cards. That's one of the things that with some of our producers, we do very, very well with. Okay? We have a producer that's got low protein wheat in his bin. So that producer comes in and says, hey, this is what I've got. I got 25,000 bushels of this. Let me see what I can do. Because there might be somebody that's looking for that, and they can actually get paid a premium up and over 14 protein spring weight. Just because they got low protein doesn't mean that somebody doesn't want it. So keep in touch. Have a good rapport with your grain buyers. Whoever it may be. Question. Yes, sir. On the protein levels of wheat or grain. Yep. Uh, how do you forecast what's going to be in demand the following year? Okay. With that, uh, there are years that I've seen, um, more times than not, you'll get a, a premium for spring wheat. Okay. So, because it's 14 protein. That's what they need, but they're paying 25 cents a quarter up, okay? So you're getting a dollar, a point on that. So if you have 16 protein, you just get a dollar above the market, okay? The last three years, that has not happened. Wheat is wheat. When I'm shipping it out to the coast, 
to Portland, there's times I don't even get a premium. I, sh I ship out a 14.25 train. I don't get a premium for that quarter. I give it to the farmer, but I took it in the shorts because I didn't. We don't, there's no need for it out there. What the goal, your end goal is at the end of the day, you shoot for a 14 protein. When you do soil samples, you shoot for a 14 protein. You do not put any more nitrogen on than for a 14. On winter wheat, 11 and a half protein. If you get higher than 11 and a half protein, you over fertilized at the end of the day. They're not paying the huge bumps. When it comes off hot and dry, just like it's been in the last couple of years, it's been setting protein. We've been getting huge proteins, high proteins, lower test weights. There's so much protein in the country, they're not paying for it. Every year is different. But when you're doing your soil samples and you're making your plants, plan for a 14 protein. That's what we're shooting for is a 14 protein. Don't try to shoot for a 16 protein, especially at these fertilizer prices today, over 900 bucks a ton. You want to back that off. You want to make sure that you're doing the right, right thing. So there's times where <clears throat> you'll find that you seeded that crop and you're, you're going to shoot for a 14 protein. You go out there with your starter fertilizer and you put a little bit of liquid or top dress on that. You know in your mind you got a 13 protein sitting there. You don't know if it's going to rain. So comes June, we got storms coming. You know your buyer, the buyer has said, we're looking for good protein. We're looking for 14 protein because it's 25 cents a quarter up and it's 50 cents a quarter down. Now you're really trying to push hard to get that protein. You go out there, you take tissue samples, and you make sure that you get the right amount of fertilizer, the best to your knowledge that you can get. You're never going to be perfect on it. But you, if you take a tissue sample, send that in, it'll kind of tell you where you're going to be at with liquid, how much liquid you would need to put on that. Do the math on it. Does it warrant putting that on? At that point, it's going towards protein. It's not going towards yield. So all you're trying to do in June is trying to get your protein to spike. So no two years are the same, but your end, the, the goal every year is a 14 protein spring weight, 11 and a half protein winter weight. That's your goal. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Okay, so barchart.com, like I said, a lot of commentary on that. That's a great site. It's in your little handouts, your pamphlets there. Write it down. It's, it's a good place to be. And it's got every commodity on there. It's got, I don't know, if maybe you guys have already been on this, but it's, it's uh, if you're interested in gold, silver, uh, cattle market, meats, the softs, it's excellent. Excellent information on that. And up to date. I think it's a five minute delay possibly on that, but it's free. So always remember that your past performance is not a guarantee of future results. But good trading is about probabilities, not predictions. So past performance can tell you something about the probability of the future. Just like we talked about with fertilizer, trying to get that 14 protein trying to get that 11 and a half protein, trying to get that yield to make it happen. Basics, cash price. You call up the elevator. You say, what's the price of 14 protein spring weight today? $9.80. How did he derive at that or she? He took the, he or she took the futures and added the basis to it. The basis is the difference between the futures price and the cash price. Simple math, right? Does everybody here understand what a basis is? 
You got the basis? You under, kind of understand the basis? We're going to go over it. But if I don't have to, I'll hit it hard if you need me to, but basis is very important. Trying to teach basis, not the easiest thing in the world for whatever reason. I've got people that will come in and sell grain and they say, what's the cash price or what's the price? Tell them the price. And then you say, well, the basis is this. And they say, what's the basis? They've been doing this a long time. But it's still something that a lot of people don't understand. <clears throat> Futures, commodity, prices for commodities such as wheat, corn, soybeans, determined by the commodity trading markets. Again, think global supply and demand. Don't sit in your office and look out the window. You might be dry sitting outside, but it could be wet in the Midwest. Knowing what your surroundings are. Um, here, uh, trading hours, the futures price will fluctuate up and down by purchases and sales made on the market. So you're rolling futures. Let's just say we're in the, the March futures right now. We're going to go to the May, okay? Because it's the 15th of the month prior to the expiration date. So you're sitting on a, on a hundred thousand bushels of wheat. You got to roll that 100,000 bushels of wheat into the next month or else you're going to have to deliver on it. So as a farmer, you push the button to roll that commodity forward. You could cause that market to go down because you're buying here and you're selling here. So by buying it, people are grabbing onto that. Then what's going on? So the market, the nearby market could be going up. The distant market could be going down. When you're buying on the futures market, it's a buying frenzy. The market will go up. Futures market will continue to rise. Okay? Because it's a feeding frenzy. Funds do this. Your big hedge funds. And that's what pushes the futures market higher and lower. Gives it the volatility. Volatility in the market is what we need in order to make this a success. You're going to find swings of 40 cents some days. It could be up 15 cents overnight. The next day, it could start lower and continue on the way down and lose 20 cents or 25 cents on the market. That's your volatility. And it's all in what the hedge funds are doing. So with the hedge funds, they are like prudential. Okay? So we invest money in prudential insurance. They've got all this big old pile of money. They decide they're going to invest it. Where do they invest it? Maybe they're going to go into the commodities. Because they are there to make money. That's all they're there for. Return on investment to the people in which they took the money from. So what they do is they'll start to buy. And that starts the market up, okay? Starts to raise the market. The futures market keeps going up and up and up. There's now a 75 cent spread from where they started buying that at to where it is today. They take that 75 cents, how do they put it in their pocket? They sell it. They buy low and sell high. That's what created the volatility in the market. So at the end of the day, it goes up, up, up. As a farmer, we're sitting there watching this going, hey, it's going to the moon. It's not going to the moon because they are there to make money. They're going to pull profit. They're going to take profits. And that market, as soon as they start to sell, they bought down here, 75 cents later, they're selling, that market is going to correct. That chart just goes up, and then it just bottoms out again, okay? So that's your volatility in the marketplace. Yeah, and something like that. 
<clears throat> they know they're going to do that daily or weekly or whatever, and they also buy puts. And so yes. They double. Yes, sir. You are absolutely correct. There's puts, there's calls, and there's a lot of different things happening now, uh, different programs where you can say, okay, um, I will sell 5,000 bushels, and if it hits this strike price, I'll double my bushels to you. So now you got double commodity on the futures market. It creates a lot of volatility. It really will. It's so, um, I'm the grain division manager. I mean, do you play the market? Nope. Can't do it. It's uh, against policy for me to do it. Insider trading. So I can't do it. It's unfortunate. <laughs> but. So with that, we've got. Uh, and again, closer to the futures month. It's more activity in the marketplace. Like right now, like I told you. We're rolling futures right now from here, from the March contract to the May. We're rolling those ahead, rolling forward. So there's a lot of volatility, a lot going on. Because we're, we got, we've already sold the market. Now we've got to buy them back. And then we're going to sell the next month. So this is where a market can get inversed really quick. Now we have been in an inverse for quite some time, and we'll talk about that. I won't get ahead of myself here. Um, trading limits, 40 cents a day for Chicago and Kansas City. You've got uh, corn at 25 cents a day. That's how far it can move before it limits out. And when it hits limit, a lock limit sometimes, and you can't trade the rest of the day. And it'll catch people in their, with their, uh, shouldn't say it. Um, it, it. They'll get them in trouble. Um, let's see, trading markets, a live trading, 8.30 in the morning to 1.20, which you got to back that up an hour because that's central. So it's 7.30 in the morning until 12.20, and then that market closes. Overnight trade, it's trading right now. If you were to go online, you'll see it. And normally it'll only trade your front month, which is right now the March. That's usually the one that's going to be active. And that one will trade from 6 o'clock at night, our time, Montana time, uh, to 6.45 in the morning. And then it starts up again. So it's 17 and a half hours a day of trades. Okay. What impacts the futures? Again, crop conditions. Uh, weather, disease, supply and demand, U.S. and globally. Again, never just look out the window. Look around. What's happening elsewhere? What's happening in the Midwest? Midwest is your, that is the winter wheat capitals down there. Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado. They've got a lot of winter wheat down there, Midwestern states. <clears throat> that that really influences the futures market with the wheat. So when you're talking about weather conditions, crop conditions, disease, so on and so forth, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the Midwest. They're not talking about Conrad, Montana. When the harvesters go through, basically they're calling the wheat about 95% harvested before it even gets into Montana. That's how large they are. They harvest the same time as Russia. So in the summertime, your market's not the greatest. Why in June, July, they're not great? They're harvesting. They're already putting wheat in the bins. So they kind of know. They know what's happening. Texas are seeding. Yep. Yep. They are seeding. So they're way ahead of us. Um, external. We talked about the funds. Um, the U.S. dollar. The oil. That all plays an integral part in your markets. Political, of course. 
and with your trade agreements like we had with China. Any questions on that? Uh, futures, this is, uh, I put this up there so we can see, like right now you're in the H, which is March, and we're rolling from March to May. You only have, and the, it's around the 15th, just always put it in your mind, the 15th of the month that it's going to expire, of the, of the next month that it's going to expire. So February 15th, that's March futures. So February 15th, you got to start, if you're trading these, you got to get out of them. Start getting out of them because I think it's the 27th or 26th is it's over. And you have to make delivery on it. So you got to start early. And this is where the volatility comes in, which I was saying. When you're trying to get out of this contract and jump into the next contract, the next month, everybody else is doing the same thing. And that's where that volatility comes into play. <clears throat> so anyway, we have December, March, May, July in the sets. The ZHKNU, those are that's all you have to know about the, the wheat market. Kansas City, or you know, on the for the futures. Kansas City is KW, Minneapolis, MW, and W is Chicago wheat. That's your white wheats. If you're playing in the market, if you're actively trading, and you want to be able to get in and out, put some calls and such like that, you want to be in the Chicago board. Chicago is your main, main uh, trading group. It's global. That's what everybody looks at. They don't look at spring wheat. They don't look at winter wheat, per se. Spring wheat's really weak for volume. Winter wheat is way better. Chicago is the best. They don't have them. They do not. We do not trade any other months. You got your D's. Whoops. You got your D's, March, May, July. That's all you have in your steps. You don't, you can't go. No, no. Now, like on soybeans, soybeans, see, you got more. This is what always confused me because you come down here and you got an August as a Q. And then you got a U and an X. Beans are different. Beans really trade hard during the last, like July, August, September, October. They trade hard. Exporters, we export September, October, November. Big export for soybeans. Huge export time. Maybe that's why it's on there. I don't know. You say trade hard. Does that mean that volatility <clears throat> goes up? Yes, indeed. Because that's when they're shipping. That's when China wants them. That's the ship period. It's off the harvest field because in a lot of these places, I haven't been b back in the Midwest, <clears throat> but a lot of people will, they'll have a little bit of storage, but a lot of it goes right to town to elevators. And those elevators get plugged quick. They got to get it on trains, get it out. So there's a lot going on during that time. So would you say like July is like the dying bottom line of the soybeans and in other words it's at it low volatility and I, then august september october or <clears throat> september november it starts to go up so no i can't say that your volatility is there okay but look what's happening if you go on online you'll see we are making huge sales on soybeans every day there's a, a just a, it's a flash, comes up, another 300 million metric tons, 30 million over here. You know, it's it's just crazy what's going on. South America and why is it happening? South America, they don't have the the weather right now. It's dry, so that's causing this. The soybean market is high, huge. I mean, it's 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 going through the roof. Corn's going through the roof. 
The reason it was is we didn't have the huge crop of corn. We didn't have a huge crop of soybeans. South America didn't have it either. Supply and demand, global supply and demand. No. No, they don't. Corn farmers was 180 bushels to the acres, what their average is um, on their yields. Corn country, like right now, okay, so let's talk about volatility and what's going to happen there. You're going to have a lot of, of these farmers. Are they going to go into wheat if they can go into corn at $6.50 a bushel? And they're making 180 bushels to the acre? Or do you think they're going to go into wheat? And they're going to make 40 bushels to the bu you know, acre. They do the math on it. Soybeans, same way. Soybeans, what, $16.5, $17 a bushel? Cool. It's pretty awesome. So that's where spring wheat is going to continue to rally through this spring because they're going to be bidding for acres. They have to have spring wheat acres. Montana is your spring wheat capital. South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana. Those are that's our that's the capital for DNS, Dark Northern Spring. You pay attention to what's going on in South Dakota. If it's dry over in South Dakota, North Dakota, market's gonna go up. Watch the weather. And it's gonna be a weather rally this year. That's why we're kind of bullish spring wing. One of the another reason why. Corn and wheat delivery periods, which really doesn't, this doesn't do much for us here, for what I'm trying to get across, but it's the delivery time frames, um, kind of like we were talking about, you know, you got your March. So if I'm selling or if I'm buying wheat over the March contract, then I can deliver it Jan, Feb, March. Uh, it's over the May, then it's April, May. When you're buying a week, do you, do you pay spot price or? Yes, it's whatever that market is. Okay, so if you call me up and say, hey, Kenny, uh, I want to sell some wheat. What's your price? I throw you a price. You call me back 20 minutes later, that price could be up five cents or it could be down 20 cents. It's whatever happens to the futures market. If the futures market goes up, you win. If it goes down, you'll lose. It's that's where the volatility comes in. You really don't know. And so as soon as you say, yeah, Ken, I will sell that to you. I hedge it. I put a hedge in the computer and it's taken care of. I make sure I lock that in for you. And for myself. Spreads. So that is your difference between the two contracts, different contract periods, okay? Just like through the March and the May, what I was saying today. It has been running a negative. If we look at the March to the May on the spring wheat, it's been running a negative. So what's that saying is that um, your right now, your spring wheat March is worth more than the May. But it's the difference between the two. That's your spread. If you have a higher price nearby on a nearby month, the month of March is worth more than the month of May, it's an inverse. Inverse market. You'll hear it on the radio. Sometimes you'll read it. But that's an inverse. If March is lower than May, it's a carry. So you carry it up. Inverse, down. And we've been running an inverse in this market for about eight months. Today, it finally came even. It finally came even. So every time we were rolling these contracts forward, you were rolling these contracts from the March, let's just say from the March to the May, it was an inverse. 
<clears throat> okay, so we were paying money to get it rolled out, costing us five, six cents to do it. Today, it was even money to roll out. So you've got your the spread in the market. It's the difference between the, the different contracts, or contract months. Usually there's a, a five to 10 cent spread. You've got your carry in the market. That's if the futures month, the future month is worth more than the nearby month. And you've got your inverse, if the nearby month is worth more than the following month. Inverse, carry. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Carry. So with that, um, when you're marketing grain, watch those markets. Because if it's an inverse market, futures are worth more today than they are next week or in the next month. It's telling the farmer, they want this now. There's not enough supply. That's what it says. That in a nutshell. That's why you'll have higher prices today. When you get to new crop, they're lower. That's the difference. Now, if you want to go do a test, I guess you guys can go. You can tell me what's going on here. So December futures is 345. May is 401. Is that a spread? Is it a carry or an inverse? That actually from December to May. December is worth 345. May is 401. May is higher. So it would probably be a carry. <clears throat> yep. Okay. So you'll see that, like right now, we can trade the uh, May 22s. You can go all the way out that far into May 22. And if you look at that, you'll see that there's probably an inverse on that. Okay. So as a farmer, again, what does it tell you? If it's an inverse, they want wheat now. That's what it's saying. How far do you look to see what their plan is? I mean, you look to the next one, that's about all you can look at. It's about it. That's about it. There's really no way to outsmart this market. You can't. And we're going to get to that too. The reason why I'm going through all this and then telling you at the end of the day, why we're doing what we're doing because you can't outsmart this market it can turn against you so fast to make your head swim now let's say you've got a december futures at 345 okay. and may futures are saying that it's 401 when it actually comes due what if that may contract goes down can that happen oh yes so there's nothing really locked in in the future. It, it's just speculation on what somebody's willing to pay right now, today, for May. Yep. And then when May comes, all these people are holding on to the grain from the December contract and saying, yeah, we're going to wait for the May, and then boom, we're at 205. Bingo. Okay. You're right on. Spot in. It's just a gamble. As a farmer, best thing to do if you have, if you like the price at 401 futures and you can lock a basis in, do a cash contract, forward contract that you will deliver that 5,000 bushels May Four. at 401 and call it a day. Draw the line in the sand. You get that. That, that's what you get. If it goes down to 201, you still made the pass. You, that's your money. That's your money. The buyer eats his ass. Yes and no, because what we're doing is we're hedging that. Okay? Oh. So I don't care if the market goes to 20 bucks a bushel. 
Doesn't make a hoot to me because I've already got it hedged. That's my protection device. Okay. If I it, five thousand is your contract size. No, I was asking why. Um, Abraham Lincoln. I don't know. I was just curious. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, that was set up way, way, way before my time, right? And that was in the pits. That's what they decided to do. Yep. And everything trades differently. Gold, silver, dollars, everything trades differently. But yeah, that was set up. I have no idea. That's just the rules of the game. Now, a real trick question here and it's kind of off branch, but is there anything on the outside of the market? So in other words, we're talking about ag. Is there anything out here that actually seesaws with this market? The dollar. The dollar only? And oil. And what? Oil. Oil. Yep. So uh, where is the seesaw at? Okay. The, cor the correlation between them, you can just take charts and you can overlay them. Okay? When the value of the dollar is really high, then your wheat market is usually lower. Okay? It's just the opposite. Because nobody can afford it. The foreign countries. Bingo. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. And it's good exercise. Go through, go on a bar chart, look at those. Pull up a chart with the uh, US dollar on it. Then pull up a chart and do a five year chart. And then do a five year chart on uh, Chicago Board of Trade. And just look at them both. The correlation between them. Right now, the dollar's higher. Okay, it's high. Wheat's doing pretty darn good. Global, because we have a shortage of it. That is a true supply and demand. But if there was such a short supply, why wouldn't we be seeing twenty-five bucks a bushel right now? If it's true that there is not any wheat out there per se, why isn't it $25 a bushel? Nobody will buy it. The man might be there, they can't afford to do it. But Russia can come in and they can lowball it. Canada can come in, the government will send them out some, some product at a lower price. And that pushes our price back down. A lot of moving parts here. Huh. It just, yeah, there's a lot of that right there. You know, what it's costing them to, uh, you know, our fuel, fuel costs and such. But it's, uh, but that is a, it is true. I've never over overlaid one, but oil and the U.S. dollar, those are two that uh, do play an important factor. Any examples of overlays? Oh, yeah. Email them to the group? Absolutely. Look at. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. It is, uh, and it's fun to see, you know, you can take your Chicago. Oh, another thing to think about is when the Chicago Board of Trade, CBOT, uh, the white wheat, when the Chicago Board is higher than the Kansas City, then there's a plenty of wheat in the country. Just Chicago's to, high, a lot of wheat. When Chicago's low? Uh, as compared to the Kansas City market, Chicago board, Chicago wheat is the junk wheat, okay? Low quality wheat. Winter wheat is your higher quality. When the junk wheat goes to higher price than the Kansas City winter wheat, there's a glut of wheat on the market. It's just a rule of thumb. As a rule of thumb, you'll see that. 
I had another one. Um, I gave a talk in Dunkirk. And they were kind of laughing at me back at St. Paul because I, I have to throw everything through them before I can present it and whatnot. <clears throat> they says, well, that's good. You know, I, I like what you're saying there, but that'll never happen. What I was telling them was about if, you know, we have X amount of bushels of wheat available every year. And at the current supply rate, we could have lasted for 27 years. But if you have one bad year, yeah, it's going to go down quickly. Your reserves are. If you have two bad years, you're going to be in trouble. And they were like, ha, ha, ha. It happened. I couldn't believe it. Our reserve just went in the tank. And that's where our market price, look what happened last year. We started out like this, normal, right? Winter we'd hit $5. Holy crap, people were selling it like there was no tomorrow. Then it went to $5.50, $6. This is like a bidding war, it's like an auction sale. It's crazy. Just... Yeah. Why again do you think that happened? Why do you think it jumped so hard? Weather. It was a weather rally. We didn't have it. We didn't have the wheat. They were saying they killed the wheat, I don't know how many times over the winter time, but then the summer they had nothing going on, right? They didn't have the, the they weren't predicting big crops of wheat. That creates a feeding frenzy. Funds jump in. The volatility, and away we go. Up, 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 and away. Weather rally. That's what that was. And we are based on ourselves on the same thing this year. I believe we're going to have another weather rally into the spring, and you're going to see higher prices here the end, middle to end of March. You're going to have nice big prices. And plus the Midwest is due for some massive storms. I don't know. They're saying they, they missed all of this this last go-around. All the winter wheat company, all the winter wheat country missed them, missed all the weather. Yep. Russia, Ukraine, political. Again, Russia's trying to get in there and take over Ukraine. What's that doing to the market? Right back up. We lost a buck and a quarter. Next thing you know, we're right there. We're dollar better. I told you I'd talk a little bit about basis. And again, we've got uh, your local cash, your futures price. The difference is your basis. Basis can be positive or it can be negative. Many times on winter wheat, it's a negative basis. Spring wheat went into a negative basis here a few years ago, and it didn't come out of it for quite a while. Right now, you'll see winter wheat. They want winter wheat in the country or in, you know, overseas. We're bidding a buck and a quarter over. Dollar twenty-five basis. Positive. It's huge. Huge money. So you take that dollar twenty-five plus the the eight dollars and sixty cents on the futures market. Boom. You've got it made, right? I've seen it though before where it's, and anytime I do an HDA contract, hedge to arrive contract with somebody, which is means that they lock in the 5,000 bushels of wheat for future delivery. Just the futures is all they're doing. I always say, can you live with a negative 50 basis? 50 cents off that price, can you live with it? If the answer is yes, we'll do the contract. Because I've seen it before. I've seen it actually worse than that. But 50 cents under, it's what we call it. It'd be an under contract on the basis. You'll see. Over contract basis either, do you? I will. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If it comes to. 50 cents either way. Okay, let's just say that today you said, can I want to do 5,000 bushel contract 
for December, over the December, the Z, okay? All right, I can do that. I'll lock you in at $8.75 a bushel on the futures market. Basis, you ask, what's the basis? Minus 25. Well, I'm just going to hold on to my contract. So you've got that 5000 locked in on the December contract, which means that September, the end of September, October, November, or December, you've got time to deliver that. You have those four months of basis to choose from. September might be a higher basis. The end of September might be a higher basis than November. It's the farmer's right to be able to choose that number. If he wants to deliver during that time, he can have that basis number. Now you add them together and you get your cash price. So if the basis goes up to a buck and a quarter, add it, add it to 875, 10 bucks. And now you have $10 cash and nobody can take it away from you unless you don't deliver on it. Uh, this was just a slide with the uh, how we get out to the PNW, Pacific Northwest. So we're here, and we are one of the closest shuttle facilities to the PNW, Shelby is. Conrad here, we got UGC. They take her up, they have to go into Shelby and then across. You've got Fort Benton, Kershaw, EGT. They have to go all the way back into Great Falls and then back to Shelby and then across. Haver, he's on the main line here. And then you've got Macon, you've got Circle, you've got a lot of groups over here in the, I'm in the wrong one. Here we are. You've got a lot of, yeah, I was way over here. There's elevators there too, but. A uh, lot, of, lot of elevators on the high line, but our freight rates for being on the high line are way better than the ones that are in country, okay? And we have a great infrastructure to do that. The, the rail, Burlington Northern has done it. They're, they're tough to deal with. They're expensive, but we're very thankful that we have them to be able to get grain out of here. Um, impacts on basis. You get your corn and your beans. Of course, you can tell that this slide came from St. Paul, Minnesota, um, Ukraine, China, Australia. And then also the time of the year. Like I said before, the time of the year, if you look at November, you might be able to give that farmer better basis in November than December. Why? Because that's when they want it. That's when they want it at the coast. So it's all dependent. And the, usually the elevators don't make it up, you know, what the basis numbers are. They're very close to where we're at. You know, if you were to call five elevators, I'll bet you you're within 10 cents. And a lot of it's freight also. The freight differential, what it costs them to get it to the coast. How to re read a bid sheet. Okay, so again, I'm beating it into your head. So this is 14 protein DNS. Everything is based on a 14 protein as we as you price any spring weight, okay? 11 and a half protein, as I said, that's your winter weight. So you're shooting for an 11 and a half protein winter weight, 14 protein spring weight. Okay. So we look at this, February delivery, $9.53 on winter wheat. March, April, May, look at June. Is that a carry or is that an inverse? It's an inverse. Your grain is worth more here than it is here. Look at your basis, buck and a quarter basis. I just did this on the yesterday or the day before. Okay, so a buck and a quarter basis, you get into June, 65. Why? They don't want the wheat. They don't want wheat there. 
this is what you need to look at as a farmer. When you're marketing, make sure you watch this. Watch those bases. Watch where the best time frame is for you to sell your grain for the most profitability. Ask yourself, is it worth five cents a month to leave that grain in my bin for three months to get that 15 cents more? What's that going to do for me? If I have a 5,000 bushel bin a week and I'm going to get 15 cents more if I hold it for three months, what, what are a couple things that you would be thinking about? I can get 15 cents more in three months. I have to maintain the quality in that bin. As a farmer, I know I put a little grain in there and it was a little damp. You could lose quality. You could lose that 15 cents really fast. You could hit falling number issues, lose 25 cents right out of the gate. Also, what's the interest on your money? Why do you have that 5,000 bushels? Why do you want to sell it? Do you need instant cash today? Or can I wait for three months? How much am I paying on interest on that? Why does an elevator charge you five cents a month carry to carry your grain on like a, a fee, handling fee or a storage fee? Why would he charge five cents a month? It costs you five cents a month to carry that grain in your bin. But if I can't ship that grain, that elevator, if you just bring it to me and you don't sell it, can't really ship it until you sell it to me. It costs you five cents a month, and that's charge. You're going to get charged five cents a month. It just cost it. That's, that's a, another rule of thumb. So think about when you want to sell that grain, how much you want to sell, and if you need it, if the quality is going to deteriorate on you, you better be thinking about all those different things. Five cents a month really doesn't cover a whole lot. We do too. We don't pay it. We just say it's free storage. Yep. I am sitting in that elevator with your grain. How much should I pay you for it? Nothing. You haven't sold it to me. You haven't sold me any grain. What's it costing me? My fee is five cents because what if it goes out of condition on me? What if I can't get it sold? What if the basis goes against me? Okay. There's all those factors. And plus I have elevations. So it took, it took electricity to get that elevated into that elevator, right? And cost me, you know, I got labor. So I have monthly expenses. And so I'm not going to be, I'll be a free storage, but it's still going to cost you at the end of the day. There's a cost to it. Yeah, at the end of the day, because now they got your grain, and what are you going to do? If they want to drop the basis, if they want to drop the basis 10 cents on you, what are you going to do? You can't tell them no. So they just took advantage of 10 cents from a farmer. Darn elevators. <laughs> All right, we'll get, jump back on this. I'm probably running late. Um, so if you look at this, this is new crop on the winter wheat, eight dollars and twenty-two cents. So there's a big difference. Today you can sell your wheat for nine fifty-three, but new crop when you take it off the combine, you can sell it for eight twenty-two, thirteen under basis. 
Winter wheat has a carry in the market. 828, 831. Look what this is. February, March, April. What happened in April? We had to be out of our March contracts. So there's your futures change. You guys see that? That's your futures change right here. From the March contract to the April contract, we had to roll our futures forward. They didn't do anything to the basis. You got a 0.0425, you got a 0.04. Not a big difference. Okay? So you got a quarter of a cent. So with the with the futures changes on this and your basis, you are still sitting here nearby. You're better off. The market is telling you to sell your grain now. Do not wait till new crop harvest to sell it. It's basically what it's saying. I'm sorry, what? How many people do ground piles? I don't have one. I don't know. I really don't. I think it's all in how it goes out there. So if it's if it's in good condition, if it's dry when it goes out there and there was no rainstorms on it and the, the pad was prepped correctly and it's contained and it was tarped on time and it had air on it, probably nothing. They'll make it up in the carry in the market because it'll be worth more in the future than it is today. So that's where they'll make their money up. If we look at spring weight. Okay, so right now, February futures, 966. What's happening down here? New crop, September, 929. Inverse in the market. It's horrible. It's been doing this for about seven months, six months. It's been tough to get ahead of it. But like I told you guys earlier, today it went even. So your March and your May contracts were even. So you could trade them out at even money. Any questions on this, on the bid sheet? Pretty, it's very simple, simple math. But again, the takeaway, watch your basis. Watch the carry in the market or an inverse in the market. That will tell you what to do. If you're ready to sell your grain now, sell it in the future. If the market's worth more in the future, how long can you hold on to your grain without having to pay the bank or an equipment payment, land payment, whatever, or letting that go out of condition? I have a good one. Well, I'm not going to tell it to you. I better not. Um, this will be the last stuff I'm going to go through here. Um, per acre marketing plan, less stress, more reward. I had this last year too. It's very simple to put a marketing plan together if you know your break even. Everybody should know their break even on their farm. You know your expenses from start to finish. Sure, you're going to have an engine blow out of a tractor and it could cost you another eighteen thousand to thirty thousand. I don't know. It could just an extra expense, right? But on a normal input basis, you should know where you're at. You should know how much your chemical is going to cost your fertilizer or your seed. You should know how much your harvest is going to cost you. Your spraying applications are going to cost you. You'll know all of that, so you can break this down really easily. And this is on your operation. My operation, it might cost me more or less. Okay, it could cost me higher amount of monies to operate my farm than it does your farm. Okay, so you have to base this on your own farm. But your total inputs divided by the total bushels is your break even. So break even 
what we want to do is we want to find the break even. We have to add some profit here. And that's where we're going to get our target price goal. Let's just say that $250 per acre inputs. That's what it's going to cost me to put spring wheat in, say. 250 bucks. I want a 20% return. Simple math. Take 250 times 1.20 is 300 bucks. And my yield is 35 bushels to the acre. That's what I'm projecting. It's a dry year, 35, should be able to do that. Here it is. 250 divided by 35 bushels is $7.14 a bushel. That's your break even. Target price, 300 divided by the 35 bushels per acre, $8.57. Would that be in shows you guys where it's winter? And so will you hit pretty hard with the fertilizer price? Not yet. Spring wheat. Spring wheat. So, what have you kind of like gave projections from or made any projections of what? Okay, this is what my fertilizer already costs. This is what my seed already costs. And of course, fuel. Have you made any projections what it's going to cost you per acre? Yeah, you have you got a you got a round number. Is it looking like I would say what percentage do you think it's going to be higher this year than it was last year to put a crop in? Yeah. Is it ten percent? Is it twenty percent? Thirty percent? And that's what I'm really curious about. You know, you guys got a percentage number? Uh, percentage per se that we could put up compared to last year. You're looking at I think the farmers are disadvantaged because the market doesn't give a shit about what the farmers, you know, overhead is or what the actual cost is. And so if let's say there's an overabundance of grain on the market and they're paying pennies, this is where the farmers get hit. You know, you'll either have to hold on and then you're going to have to spoil it. Oops. And so. The other thing you don't know, though, is like I said, you don't know this year what's going to happen. You're going to go out there and you're going to pay $900 a ton for urea. Throw it on the ground, right? You're going to be paying $41, $42 a gallon for Roundup. If you haven't purchased it, it's going to cost you some bucks, right? Tires. You're probably 75% higher this year. If you blow a tire on a combine, get the checkbook out. Everything, everything that we have done, everything we've done has gone up. It doesn't matter what chemicals. You just got to call. Chemicals are going up again. Yeah. They've already had two price increases. They're going for a third. You really think it's supply and demand? We got the chemicals out there. I know we do. Right? I think halfway, I'm shouldn't be saying this, but I think they're taking advantage of the farmer at the end of the day. Um, you've got your fertilizer, like I said, has gone up some substantially. So what are you going to fertilize for? There's some people that are not going to put fertilizer down. And what are they going to get for yields? What if it doesn't rain? It ain't going to be easy. Farming this year is going to be, it'll be fun, but, and I hope it's rewarding. So let's look at this. Uh, total operating cost, marketing plan. This is the overall, this is just another way to work it. Um, if you want to look at it, we'll assume that we're going to be planting a thousand acres of 35 bushels. I need, I need a quarter million dollars to operate this and I'm going to have 35,000 coming in to cover it. So $250,000 cash divided by the 35,000 bushels again is your $7 and 14 cents. 
your ROI of 20%, but you at 300. It's just another way to look at your calculations on a whole. So if you got, if you have a note, you owe the bank. Overall, this is how much I owe. This is how much grain I have. How much do I have to sell that grain for in order to pay the bank off? But I want a little extra money to start the next year. Add that to it. Now you know your goal. When it comes to pulling the trigger, the market, let's just say 857 is where we were at. We had a nice profit. We can pay all of our bills and we can afford to farm the next year. When it hits that, are you going to pull the trigger? Why? It's one of the biggest problems we have right there. The gamble. You got to draw the line in the sand. You have to draw the line in the sand. I've never seen anybody go broke making a profit. Not one person. Never. Greed will drain you. It'll, it'll, it'll crush you. Don't try to play the market. Here's another thing. If you want to go ahead and sell that, let's just say we're going to give up ownership of that grain, $8.57. Took it into the elevator, got my money, paid everybody off. Got my new operating. I want to reown that because I'm seeing in this market that the market's going to go up. Play the markets on paper. It's a heck of a lot cheaper to make money on paper than it is putting that crop in the ground. Marketing is your very most important aspect of this farming. We can know everything about everything on this agriculture, but if you can't market your grain, you can't pull the trigger, not going to win. And that's really a decision, decision you have to make. It's not an easy one. It's not easy at all because it's your livelihood, right? I sell it for $9 and it goes to $15. Are you going to be kicking yourself? You shouldn't. You should never look back because you made a profit. If you made a profit, you're, you'll be able to farm next year. What your farm is doing, that's all that matters. You bet. You got to make that profit and you're not going to go broke. But that's what I've got. Is there any more questions for me or any questions whatsoever? Or can you lock in all 7,000? Yeah, I can lock in all seven. Yep. All 7,000 can be locked in. You can lock in any quantities you want. When you do an HTA contract, hedge to arrive contract, that's what I'm talking about. When you're taking an individual um, uh, position in the market for future, that's when you, you do it on 5,000 bushel increments. You're not going to come in to me and say, well, I want a thousand bushels for December delivery. Okay. Because I can't even, you know, that's just a small hedge and that kind of puts your position out of whack. So uh, we do 5,000 bushel increments. But on sales, you come in and you got 3,250 bushels. I'll buy 3,250 bushels, no questions asked. I'll manage that risk because it's nearby risk. I'm not going to do it over December. It's too far away. So, absolutely. Thank you, guys.